to be with you this morning. And uh, we're going to continue with our series on purpose. I see it says there week three, but I believe it's week four, purpose three, in those little green books. If there's anybody here that uh, doesn't possess one of those, doesn't own them, is there somebody who doesn't have any of those? There's one at the back there. Maybe if you can just get a book. And over here as well, there's a couple there as well. So we're working through the series which is on purpose, the purpose uh, that God has called us to in life, and we're going to continue with that this morning. And the key scripture that we've been looking at is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. But before we get into that, I've just felt I want to pray for us. Father, as I look over this community this morning, I want to thank you, Lord, for your heart for your people. I want to thank you, Lord, that you've declared and decreed that it is through the church that your manifold wisdom would be made known. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, as you look upon these people this morning, how collectively they've come together to serve you, to honor you, and to praise you. I thank you, Lord, that you do a work in their hearts today. Father, that your word would become alive. I realize how inadequate I am to share your word. But Father, you are the one by your Holy Spirit that brings life to the word and revelation. But this morning, Lord, the sense of community is strong upon me, and I bless these people. I want to thank you, Lord, for their service. I want to thank you for your calling in their lives. I want to thank you, Lord, that you have made each and every one of them completely different. Not one fingerprint the same, not one eye the same. Completely different personalities and attributes in each and every one of them. But Lord, as you look down upon us today, I pray, Lord, that you would be pleased at the service of your people. I thank you, Lord, for giving us those opportunities, that you would create opportunities for us to find our purpose in life. So we commit this time to you, Lord, and we ask that you bring revelation to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, is our key scripture, and it reads, For we are his, which is God's, workmanship. So there's a possessiveness about that. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I just love the pot illustration we had last week with Maria doing the pot or the vase. And every single action of hers would determine how that pot came out. Every little even movement of the finger would change something of the dimensions of that pot. And that's true with you and I. Now God has created each and every one of us as, as different. There's not one of us in this room that is similar in any way. We each have, have uh, different gifts. We've got different uh, attributes. We've got different personalities. We've got different characters. We've got different skills. Each and every one of us in this room is unique. And we're God's workmanship, as the Scripture says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so it's not just that that pot just sits there. But God has created us for action. He's created us to do something. He's created us for a purpose. And that is our discovery this morning as we continue with this journey, that he has created us for good works, which he prepared beforehand. And so, again, you and I are absolutely unique. It's quite, uh, quite fascinating to think of God envisioning you before you were even created and saying, this is what you would look like. This is what the sort of the skills and abilities you would have in you, all prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so... The key is not to disappoint him. He has a walk for us, a journey for us, a purpose for us, and that is the journey that we're on at the moment. And each and every one of us has a unique purpose, to walk in the good works that God has created for us. And so we would realize, obviously, that we will only discover that purpose if we do certain things. And the first thing would be to walk in it. In other words, to do something. I mean, I would never know my wife and the abilities and the gifts she has unless we journeyed together and I'd seen her live those things out. And that's true for you and I. There needs to be an activity that you and I are involved in for us to discover our purpose. So we walk in them, walk in the giftings we've got. We expose ourselves to the opportunities. There are many different ones, like this uh, little video in terms of Mozambique. People going on that, maybe even for the first time. There's Swaziland down the road. We're going to Kapsu Hoof in a couple of weeks' time. A small group of us are going there. And we're going to take over their service. We're going to be at the door to greet them as they come into their own church. We're going to do the worship there. We're going to do, we're taking cupcakes and muffins. We're going to wash their dishes. We're going to 
honor them and, and worship and praise God together with them. But we're coming with a purpose, and we will discover within that, people will say, this is something I've really enjoyed doing. Why? It's because they put action to their words. They've exposed themselves to the opportunities. And then, of course, each and every one of us, having these different gifts and abilities that we have, our talents and our resources, it's only as we begin to live those things out that we begin to find our purpose in life. It's a lovely scripture in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. I love this one, which says that we may know how we ought to, or one ought to work. Sorry, bigger part. Let me start again. You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And so today we're speaking about community. You are the household of God. It's not this building. This is not the church. You are the church. And wherever you find yourself, at work, at play, at schools, businesses, shops, at home, you and I are the church in action. We're living out church. How we ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the ch church. And you know Ephesians 3.10 says, it's through the church that God is going to work. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to principalities and powers. And so this morning, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at community. We're looking at church. We're looking at you and I and our function and role within, within all of this. And so let's have go to 1 Peter chapter 2, where we go to major on this morning and have a look at a few scriptures there. Ideally, we should have read through the first 25 verses, but we're just going to take snippets out of that because of time. And there are three things I would like you to look at this morning. The first one is the purpose of the church. That's for you and I, our purpose. The second one is to identify that there is definitely a tension between the church and the world. I'm sure you living in this world, you will realize the many things that grieve you, the very many things that would oppose your value systems, your beliefs, and things like that. There's this tension between us. And then thirdly, for us to discover how to maintain that tension. Now, it's interesting that normally you, what you try to do is you try to do away with tension, don't you? But actually, we're called to maintain that tension. We're going to have a look at that this morning. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and looking at verse 5. And here we identify, first of all, we're looking at ourselves this morning. And it says, you yourselves, each and every one of us, are like living stones, be, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then we're going to jump to verse 9. And it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. There's so much love, and so much, um, just the, 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 the desire of God for us to have a deeper understanding that we're chosen by him, we're molded by him, we're shaped by him, we're fashioned by him, we're given identity by him, we've given attributes and personalities and all of these things. God has invested those things in our life. And here we see it. You're a chosen race, a chosen people. We may not feel special today, but as we read these, we recognize our identity in Christ, of who he has made us, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim an action, an activity. It's not dormant, it's not quiet, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, I implore you, as sojourners and exiles, as strangers, as aliens, is that, that wording there. You're strangers and exiles, sojourners, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct, that's your activity, the service. You, you, I don't think you can be an inactive Christian. I, I think it's an oxymoron there. If you're a Christian, there has to be some action. There has to be activity. It's lived out, Christianity. It's not something that's retained from within. Keep your conduct, your activity amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we're going to unpack that a little bit right now. So what does this community look like? First of all, it talks about living stones. And here it uses the word plural. So you and I 
are the living stones that are spoken of here. Amen. We're living stones. We're not just dead stones. We're living stones. It's plural. The many. It talks about the many. We're talking about community this morning. And we're built into a singular, a spiritual house. And so we're built together as a church. We come together. We're the stones, which are the present tense, active. Right now you are a stone. And you're being built into, which is a progressive thing. So you and I, as we journey with Christ, as we, as we fellowship together, as we learn from one another, as we read the Word of God together, as we pray together, as we explore together, as we get out there together, we're growing. This, this, the present continuous tense is beginning to happen. You and I know that a stone standing alone is of no use. It's like a piece of wood in a fire. You pull it out of the fire and it begins to die. It's only when it's in community that it's, it has life that is breathed into it. And so we, hear, we, we see here in, in 1 Peter that Peter is imploring, he's urging. Folk, understand this, that you and I are living stones and that we're in community, that we're together. We're locked and built in together. Look at each every, every one of these bricks. They mortared together. They're strong together. One stone alone has no strength, but all of those stones together have phenomenal strength together. And they provide shade and protection and all of those things. Together in community, they stand together. They are interdependent. In other words, they knit together as one. And that is the church of the living God. That's you and I. Not excluded, not in, uh, independent, but interdependent. Relying upon one another. God has ordained that it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God will be shown. So I want to ask you a question this morning. And it can be an ANR question in some ways. The question is this. Are you and I so built into people's lives that if you stopped coming, it would affect others in the war? It's... It, <laughs> It's quite, quite an intense one, and I don't want to sort of uh, create depression in the room. But it really just makes me realize that I'm nothing special, but I am different. And so as we come together, we bring these gifts and resources and abilities and, and attitudes and all of these things. As we serve together, we build one, each and every one uh, up in our most holy faith. So the question is, if you and I... Um, if you and I are so built into people's lives that if we stop coming, would it affect others in the war? Now, it's not an arrogant question, that. It's just, it shows us that we desperately need one another, that God has ordained. There's a lovely scripture in Acts 17 that says, God has ordained the place for you to be. And if this is your place, if this is your family, then together we serve God in community. And so we see from this the importance of connectivity and the partnerships that we have together interdependent, being involved together. And I love this little saying, is that you and I prosper in our faith together. I've learned over many years, I got saved in 1973, so that's donkey's years ago. In the beginning. <laughs> Thank you for that. But in the beginning, I thought I could do this on my own. And in this journey of over 50 odd years, I've realized how interdependent I am on many others. There's so many one another's in the scriptures to love one another, to care for one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another. And so they go on and on and on and on. And I've realized that it is through the church that God works, that he builds us together as we, and we prosper in our faith together. I, I mean, I've still got a long way to go just in terms of my faith and my journey with God. But as I journey on, I learn, I've, I've, I've met with different people even this week, and they've spoken into my life, and, and I've grown through the interaction with them as we fellowship together, as we strengthen one another. I love the testimony that was here this morning. I was actually moved to tears by the beautiful way that God works. But did you did discern within that testimony how there were different elements in it that spoke of community, how she was encouraged to go through the waters of baptism, by Erica in the church. And I remember, in fact, myself and my son-in-law baptized her and others on that particular day. And as she came out of those waters of baptism with her husband, we prayed over her, her, her health 
And we pray for her husband who's actually had stage four cancer. He doesn't know what his condition is at the moment. He sits in the room here today. We trust God together in community. We trust God for his healing. We, we, we fight for his healing. We, we ask God, won't you break into his life, let every single cell of his body be so filled with the life of God, Lord, that cancer has no room there. We do that together. We journey together. We are warriors together. Beautiful, this illustration of the, the church being living stones together. We prosper in our faith together. And it is through that togetherness that the fullness of God is displayed. The church is an intense communal, uh, a, a, a communal community. It is so beautiful. But how do we relate now to people outside of that community? So here we've identified that you're a royal priesthood, a, ro a holy nation. You're, you're unique and you're special. And I, <laughs> I, I know that I'm, I'm emphasizing because I know sometimes I don't feel unique and special. In fact, I look at the mirror and I think, whoops, God, what did you do here? You know, we, we don't feel like that, do we, often? But man, we're the treasure of his eye, the apple of his eye. Each and every one of us, unique and special. And we need to appreciate, we need to realize that if one of us is missing out of the whole, then we're missing something very, very important. But what does this community outside look like now? So we like living stones being built into this community, which is the present tense, as I've said. But what is our relationship to this world? And you and I probably, if you're watching anything of the news today, you realize the news uh, is revealing a world that is sort of wobbling a little bit maybe a little bit more than a little bit. And there are many things that are happening out there, many challenges that are taking place. And in fact, those of the Christian faith, those that are, that are passionate and love Jesus with all of their hearts, are in fact a minority in today's world. And there's a lot of persecution taking place of Christians. And, and Christians are being uh, forced, or not forced, uh, encouraged to change their value systems and to alter their doctrines and things like There's a world outside there that is putting... A, a tremendous pressure on the Christian worldview. And so how do we relate? How does this communal, community relate to the world that is outside there? And I've said to you that we need to maintain this tension. And what do I mean by that? So we're going to look at verses 11 and 12 now. So the question is, are we to be inclusive or are we to be exclusive to this world? So to be inclusive would be to say, okay, everybody's welcome and your views are, are valid. And we'll, it's relativism. In other words, if whatever you feel like, whatever you believe is okay. That's a relativistic worldview. In other words, we accommodate, we compromise. Is it, are we to do that? Are we to be that inclusive? Or are we to be exclusive and to say we're going to close these doors, that world is too dangerous, too threatening out there, we're going to close the doors, and we're just going to have this holy huddle in here. Are we to be exclusive? Well, the obvious answer to that is neither. And we look at verses 11 and 12 of 1 Peter. And it says, Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners, sojourners and exiles, in other words, strangers, you're, we are aliens. There's something different about us. Not superior, not arrogant in any way, but there's a difference. I, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh. In other words, not to accommodate that worldview, not to accommodate those passions that are out there which is very much, if it feels good to you, then you can do it. Abstain from these passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. They're the kind of things that will, will destroy you. Keep your conduct, and again, this is talking about activity and service. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. In other words, to live out the Christ life, to be a people that are identified uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the Word of God. We believe the Word of God plus nothing and the word of God minus nothing. We take the word as it is. Keep your conduct, activity among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So first of all, we need to realize that we are strangers. I mean, I've been to some activities, a briar for instance, where I really, really feel like a pork chop in a Jewish synagogue. I just feel so different. Just very different. It's just, I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable. It's just, I'm a stranger. It's just things that are happening in that environment that I'm not comfortable with. We're exiles and strangers. And so the encouragement is not that we don't embrace the worldviews. We don't 
encourage the worldviews to, uh, we don't compromise with those worldviews. We're foreigners. And so when, when, when Peter's talking to them here, he was talking to the Greeks in a Greek context and the Romans in a Romans context. And so when you become a Christian, you and I become foreigners to the world and to the worldviews. We are aliens. But they didn't keep their Christianity, they didn't keep their faith private. So holy means to be separate, but not private. So consider those early Christians as you look through the book of Acts. There was a counterculture. The Christians were just a counterculture to what was taking place in the world. They did not go to bloodthirsty gladiatorial games. And so they were considered to be antisocial. They, uh, they were against abortion and infanticide. In those early days, if you didn't want your kid, you could just leave it outside to perish and you wouldn't be guilty of anything. They were inclusive in all of their interactions. They engaged with society. They didn't exclude themselves, but they were engaged in it, not compromising in any way. They were against sex outside of marriage and against same-sex same practices. They were absolutely radical for the poor. In fact, they gave so generously that it surprised the Romans and the Greeks. They were an exceptionally generous people and a caring people. They mixed the races and classes and cultures together in ways in those early days that appeared scandalous. They believed that Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation. Whereas a society that believed as it does today, you can have your own belief system and do your own thing. And they had a heart for the world, not only for their community, which they, which they, with, with whom they worshipped, but they had a heart for others. And no one had ever seen a group of people like that who held all of those values, who were strong and believing in their faith, who were not compromising, but where they were not arrogant or rude. They cared and they loved so generously, but they were aliens. The question is asked, what if there were a group of people now who were following the same group of biblical values and impacting the world? My friends, I think that is what God is calling you and I to, to be that people to be those living stones built together in community, having found out our purpose in God, dependent on your gifts, your character, your personality, your resources, all of those key things expose your purpose. And we begin to find those things that we enjoy doing. I've just, there's some things that I can do and some things I can't. I related in the first service how in one of the earlier churches we were in, uh, I'm not a great door-to-door -door guy. I'm a little bit shy. I'm a bit timid. I'm a bit of an introvert, and in the early, the early church, back in, when was it? In the beginning. Back in the beginning, uh, the church that we had did a lot of door-to-door -door ministry. And I was uh, part of the church, and therefore I was exposed to door-to-door -to -door ministry. And I'm not a good door knocker. Bernie can approach people very easily. It takes me a little bit of time. And we were given a couple to go and visit who had been to the church, and they had some things that we needed to chat through with them. And we were given the address to go to. Uh, and so off we drive. And I thought she had the address. She thought I had the address. But we knew generally where it would be. And we're driving down the road. And I see this guy outside there with a hose pipe. And he's busy watering the garden. I said, Bernie, this is it. This is this. This is the guy. And so we drove into his driveway. And uh, I jumped out of the car. Now, the, the best form of, a, of defense is offense. And that's what I did. I became... I was front-footed. I walked up to the guy, introduced myself, really nice to see you, good that we could come and visit you. And this guy was just completely bowled over, but he was very polite, and he accommodated us and took us inside. So we're sitting there, and now I begin to try to share the gospel with him and all of that, and I can see this guy just doesn't know what's going on. And then eventually he left the room to go and do something, and Bernie said to me, it's the wrong house. <laughs> you can imagine how quickly... I mean, he virtually walked in the room. I said, it's nice seeing you guys. Off we go, you know. And I thought, that is not one of my gifts. And so what we need to do is we need to explore our gifts. We need to go on different things and do different things. And eventually you and I will discover what it is. But we are, we are aliens in the world. We don't fit neatly into this, this, this world system. But, capital B-U-T, we're not exclusive. We live in this world. We are resident aliens. Although we are, we are alienated aliens, or we are aliens, we are unalienated aliens. 
And so the word in the verse 11 there, which talks about us being sojourners and aliens or strangers, it means we're not tourists, we're not visitors, we're not expatriates. We are part of this community. We, we merge in together with this community. We don't, it's, we don't allow to, uh, to, to influence us or for us to compromise. But we're there for them. We love them and we care for them. And we serve in that community. That's what we, we call to in community. We're resident aliens within them. These early Christians maintained this beautiful balance that comes out of verse 12, which says, Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the, on the day of visitation. And so we're the soul tablet. We're the light of the world. And again, it's not an arrogant statement. But we're, we're out there loving, caring, uh, serving, and uh, making a difference. There has to be pushback, friends. When we look at what is taking place in the world today, if there is no pushback, then this, this evil that is uh, besetting the world today will continue unabated. And I don't know what difference I can make in this world, but I can make a difference. You know, it's like that story of the, uh, the starfish about this old man, he's sitting on the beach back in, when was it? In the beginning. This old man in the beginning, he was sitting on the beach on the rocks, and there was, uh, in the distance, there was a young man that was running up and down this beach. And he looks at this lot and he wonders what is going on there. And so eventually he walks down to this young man and he sees that the beach is strewn with, with starfish. And he sees the young man, he runs, he picks up a starfish, he runs back to the sea, he throws the starfish into the sea. And the old man walks up to him and he says, son, what are you doing? So the young man runs, picks up a starfish, and he says, sir, I'm throwing these starfish back into the sea. So the old man looks at him and he said, look at this beach. There's thousands, literally thousands of starfish here. You're not going to make any difference. So the young man runs up, picks up a starfish, and throws it back into the sea. He said, I made a difference to that one. Now that's what God has called us to do that you and I are to be those that would make a difference. We're to live out our purpose in God. Community provides that medium for us to grow in our purpose together. We don't assimilate with the world. We don't accommodate it. We're different. We we are God's people, royal priesthood, a holy nation. And it doesn't say, I I want to emphasize this morning, it doesn't say that the, the community of faith is good, and the world out there is bad. There's bad in that world. But we mustn't think of ourselves as any way superior or anything like that. We're just ordinary people, saved by the grace of God, empowered by the Spirit of God to make a difference in this world. The inner logic of this worldview is vastly different to ours, my friend. And I, they, I, I personally have a fear for the church in the sense that I think there are many people that are not strong in their faith are not strong in their basic doctrines, are not strong in their belief systems. And there's so much there that would, would appeal to logic, which is completely illogical. And so we as a community need to be strong together, not compromising with the cultures that live out there. We are unalienated aliens. And so in conclusion, we discover our gifts through service. You and I only will discover our strengths and our abilities and those things that we enjoy doing if we begin to put our hand to something and we try these different things, you won't find me knocking at doors, but you will find me loving people and caring and and teaching or whatever it is, whatever your gift is, we need you. If one brick is missing from that wall, it's going to be so obvious and the wind is going to blow through it. Each and every one of us, critically important to the whole. We discover our purpose through, through different activities and we need to experiment with those. We discover our purposes when we meet real needs. And your heart and my heart is broken when we get out there and we see the needs of of many. And when you and I get out there and we we serve this broken world, friends, there's nothing that catches the heart more than that, is there? It's just your heart is broken for that world that is out there. And when we're meeting real needs. And finally, we discover our purpose when we work it out in community, when together we serve God. The greatest purpose we can have is in the service of Christ. To find our value and purpose in what we do for Him. Whilst giving time to many other pursuits in life. For the Christian. For the living stone. Our focus and drive must surely be as servants of the Most High. To be lovers of God and ministers of reconciliation. Father, we just want to thank you. 
this morning as we explore your word and study the truth that come out of them. We pray, Lord, that there might be a revelation in our own hearts, that there might be something of a burning fire within that we cannot contain, something, Lord, that sets us alight to be proactive for you. And whatever that gifting may be, whatever the abilities that you've given us, Lord, help us to serve you with distinction so that one day, Lord, as we enter into eternity, our life would have had, the life that we've lived here on earth would have had some value because of the relationships and the activity that we've had in your service. Lord, these people that sit here before me today, I can declare before you, Lord, I love them and I appreciate them. And I appreciate, Lord, that there are many that might be hurting here, many that are suffering from different things. But as a community, Lord, we want to stand together with them. As a community, Lord, we want to push back. As a community, Lord, we don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be superior in any way. But, Father, we desperately want to make a difference in the society in which we live. We want to praise you for the healing uh, um, testimony that we heard this morning. We seek out, Lord, for people to be healed and restored, delivered, set free. Father, we seek the truth of your word. And so as a community of God, as your people, Lord, we honor you and thank you for the, the opportunities that you will give us this coming week to serve you and to find our purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.